Welcome everybody, Professor Steve here. Um, and in this, our first lecture of the, our last online week, um, we will really start to to uh, close the gaps in in all the pictures that we've that we've painted so far. So, so drawing lines between all the little bits and pieces we've learned. Uh, we've learned an awful lot about the biology and the chemistry, how that all works, and why it's important in the ocean. We've learned an awful lot about now. Um, how the ocean moves and why, how it interacts with the atmosphere um, to, to, to cause all kinds of uh, layers of circulation and, and what the significance of that is. Um, and so now for this week we'll spend uh, a few lectures talking, uh, dr sort of uh, connecting the dots between all of these pieces um, and how all of it is in, uh, intricately linked with with um, with essentially how the entire globe functions in terms of um, of all the pieces we've talked about so far. So we're going to start first by talking about um, uh, upwelling. Essentially, one of the most important features that occurs in the in the ocean um, for several reasons. But we um, the, the the overall theme of this entire unit is essentially that you know we t we we laid down the rules very specifically about the surface ocean and the and the uh, deep ocean being completely separate layers being stratified from each other. But there's obviously places um, such as where um, thermal haline circulation turns over and these kinds of things, but um, where where that's not strictly true, right? Where we get mixing of the layers. There's 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 cases. The first of those cases is equatorial upwelling. Um, but the overall theme of this unit is there's exceptions to all the rules we've laid down, um, and that the mixing between those two layers has really important consequences. Right, so um, this is how we laid things out. There's a surface layer. There's no mixing between the surface and the and the deep layer. Um, we laid out sort of the physical, some of the physical parameters that that are different between those two layers, and the fact that in general, because of the activity that all almost all occurs in the surface layer, it's it's low in nutrients, and the deep layer, because of the activity that happens there, is very high in nutrients. <laughs> So what happens if we break that layer and start mixing, um, mixing these two together, um, in the term that we call upwelling? Uh, and what happens is we break that barrier. We pump this abundance of nutrients um, along with carbon dioxide and oxygen. We pump these things up to places where they're necessary. And what happens is we fuel further blooms of primary production and in, ter and in fact this process this upwelling process of deep water into the surface bringing with it all these fuels um, is what accounts for the majority of the primary production in the ocean so that that large portion of global primary production that occurs in the ocean almost all of it occurs due to upwelling events and this equatorial upwelling is is only one of the the major places and because upwelling only occurs under certain circumstances and only in certain certain places and so that's what this whole unit is about so in order to to finish to to understand equatorial upwelling we just have to revisit and remember a little bit of, about what we learned for um, atmospheric circulation right we have um, low low pressure latitudes, high pressure latitudes that set up these cells, the Hadley cell, the polar cell, which spin up the feral cell. When we lay this out on a three-dimensional earth, right, we get this deflection by Coriolis and we get this rotating, um, this helical long-term wind patterns on earth. But if we look how these come and are deflected at the equator, right, the wind is deflected this way, in the southern hemisphere, deflected this way in the northern hemisphere, and they're kind of all driving this way in a westward direction, right? If we remember at the equator, um, the effect of Coriolis is zero. So if wind's driving this way, wind's driving this way, and as we get to the equator, the deflection becomes zero, it drives this long-term, very strong wind, wind band um, along the equator, westward. So the, this has several long-term effects. If you get a long stretch of ocean where this wind can just build up for um, persistently throughout the year, it's going to affect sea level and the thermocline. 
So we call that a surface zonal wind, right? We have this long-term zonal wind constantly. Um, so it's, uh, this is the Pacific um, Ocean Basin. So over here is, if this is on the equator, over here is uh, Latin America, over here is Southeast Asia. The wind is continually blowing westward over the surface of the ocean. And we know that the wind will interact with the surface of the ocean and actually transfer energy and push that ocean, push that water, right? So if this happens very, in a very strong way, in a very persistent long-term way, it actually pushes the entire surface ocean this way, or at least makes it lean this way. So we know the surface ocean is much warmer, depicted by these pink, you know, these warmer blues and pinks, um, so what happens is we pile the majority of the warm surface water in the Pacific on the western side of that ocean boundary. So this has several consequences. Okay, We call that the western warm pool. The piling of the surface ocean, um, essentially it depresses, uh, the, I'm sorry, the piling of the, the warm surface Pacific Ocean, piling it all, all that warm water off to the west, we call that the Pacific western warm pool. <coughs> So there's several consequences to this. First of all, it depresses the thermocline by piling most, you know, a bunch of the of this surface ocean over here. Um, we get a bigger body of water, and 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 to isostatically kind of adjust, we get a deeper thermocline. So warmer water um, uh, going deeper into the water. Right. The other thing we have is by having this big pile of warm moist air water over here we have light we set up a high pressure center so it's warm less dense it's moist it's humid m less dense so we get a rising a rising air mass here okay so we get rising air mass um, it diverges away from the continent because the continent is cooler so it divide diverges away and because these surface zonal winds are continual it continually pushes it and as it pushes it it it, for, it forms another type of cell just along the equator in the pacific okay we call that the walker cell so we have these strong zonal surface winds this rising warm humid air it travels over here as it gets over here it cools off it begins to condense the the humid air condense it cools off becomes drier it rains and the water become and the and the air becomes drier and 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 more dense and eventually sinks and and just completes this circuit so we have another kind of cell that just continually is pushing this warm water to the west the western warm pool Whoops. The other effect that it has is it doesn't only just depress the thermocline, it also raises the sea level. It, it literally, um, so th if this dotted line is zero sea level, you can see that um, in this schematic, you could see that not only do we have a deeper thermocline, but the water pi actually piles up in, in a mound over here, and we, uh, we actually have this, the, um, the uh, the sea surface level here tens of centimeters higher than actual sea level okay we get the opposite effects in the eastern boundary we get a a um, a much shallower thermocline a, th a cooler surface ocean and surface level is actually and uh, sea surface height is actually um, a few centimeters below actual sea level okay and that's all because of pushing this water with this cell continually over here all right so what are the other important physical consequences of this? Okay, so if this is our same ocean basin, just without the continents drawn in, over here is Latin America, over here is Southeast Asia, we constantly have this, um, this westward surface zonal winds blowing this way, right? And the walker cell feeding it, constantly feeding it. So what happens? On the equator, this is, we're pushing the water this way, and on the equator the effect of... of um, Coriolis is zero, but as we get away from the equator, right, it's really this whole mass area here that's all pushing this way. As we get away from the equator, right, the the water that's moving begins to become deflected to the right 
of the equator, right? And it's a small effect close to the equator. As you get further away, it's a bigger effect. As you get big further away, it's a bigger effect. So here the water is traveling directly this way, but as we get away from the equator, it's starting to curve to the right in the, in the northern hemisphere, it's starting to curve to the left in the southern hemisphere. So what we have is this continual movement of surface water, not only towards the west, towards this way, where the western warm pool is, but we also have the water sort of peeling out in this direction. Away and in, away into the right in the northern hemisphere, away into the right in the southern hemisphere. So this is an overhead view of the ocean. Right? If we look at a cross section, right, we have the wind is here blowing directly at us into our faces, and this is the northern hemisphere. So the water on the surface is continually coming at us, but it's also as you get away from the equator, it starts deflecting this way in the northern hemisphere, it starts deflecting this way in the southern hemisphere. So if all the water on the surface is pushing away, is leaving on this way from in the south and leaving this way in the north, how come there's no how come there's not a big dip in water here if the water is continually leaving? And the answer to that is because it's replaced from below. The water leaves from the surface here is replaced by water from below. The water leaves from the surface here and is replaced by water from below. Okay? That is upwelling. When water is driven away from the surface and is replaced from water below. Okay? And this is how equatorial upwelling works. So if we look at a 3D um, version of this, right? We have the, the trade winds, the surface zonal winds blowing this way. We have the water continually being driven away from the equator, the surface water being driven away, and continually being replaced by upwelling. See, there's like a depression here because that water is continually being driven away, but it's always replaced by water from below. Okay, so let's look at it in another schematic, right? So here we are, western warm pool, because the wind's always blown this way, a raised sea surface height, a depressed thermocline, all the warm water here. Cool water and a shallow um, thermocline over here. Now, we add our so surface zonal winds are causing all that, causing a change in sea surface height, changing, causing the change in, in, um, <clears throat> in the thermocline depth. It also is causing this upwelling, right? So if th the strength of this upwelling is determined by the strength of this wind. So if it's weak wind, it's weak upwelling. If it's strong wind, it's strong upwelling. But, how, but the depth of this, if you remember our, our lecture about Ekman transport, the depth of this um, is called the Ekman depth, right? So that's also the upwelling depth. But it's consistent, right? So the wind is so strong, it makes upwelling so strong, but it's consistent upwelling across the whole area and it penetrates to a certain depth. Now over on this side, the thermocline is depressed, so upwelling is just coming from within the surface ocean. We're just pumping more, more of this warm, um, nutrient-depleted water as we go along here. But as soon as we get the thermocline shallower than the upwelling depth, now we've broken through the barrier, right? We've broken from the surface ocean here into the deep ocean, and as we continue to go along here, we see that upwelling is pumping more and more of this deep water up into the surface and now we've broken this barrier between the stratified layers and what are we doing we're upwelling bottom water okay this bot we're not just upwelling this surface water over here we're upwelling the bottom water what's in the bottom water fresh o2 fresh co fresh co2 and tons of nutrients when we get this continual upwelling of nutrients we get lots and lots of productivity <coughs> Okay, so here we go again in 3D, in a three-dimensional um, picture. We got the wind going along the equator here. It's pumping water away. It's diverging water away from the equator. The water is replaced from below. Once we get the water, the upwelling replacement from below, once we get that to be deeper than the thermocline, like here and here, we have continual upwelling for a picture that looks like this, okay? And remember we have wa lots of warm and moist air water in the in the western boundary, lots of cool um, dry air descending, setting up this walker cell, um, and these are sort of the typical conditions of um, uh, of the, the equatorial Pacific. And so we see um, and, and the point to, to remember is that when we have this mixing, when we pump this stuff up, 
when we pump bottom water into the surface water, we're fueling primary productivity. And in the case of equatorial upwelling, if we look at this, this satellite image of, of chlorophyll A concentrations in the ocean, you can see that this is all chlorophyll. This big streak of blue is all chlorophyll due to equatorial upwelling. And because these are long-term persistent global wind patterns, this is one of the more persistent instances of, of continual primary productivity. Okay, thanks very much. See you next lesson.